September 2015, and in a quiet, picturesque corner of Dali Abbey, a horrific sexual attack was about to shatter the peace and tranquility of a nature reserve and trigger one of the biggest manhunts carried out by Derbyshire police in years. What we know is that as she walked into that local nature reserve, she initially sees the, the man that turns out to be the offender. And because she doesn't like the look of him, she decides that she's gonna walk in the opposite direction, thinking that he's on his, his way out of that nature reserve. As she walks round, she gets approximately halfway around that nature reserve when she is attacked from behind, and we know the terrible events that unfold from that point. Strange rapes are, are rare, absolutely. Um, we don't get many of them, and when we do, clearly it becomes a priority for us. Um, they take, obviously, a, a, an in-depth investigation. Um, we put more resources to it, and um, it's always imperative to us to try and find, find the person responsible when it's a stranger rate, because you know the impact's huge, and for us it's huge that um, there's always the potential they'll strike again. There's always the potential um, they'll do more than rape. Um, so, yeah very rare, huge priority for us. Detectors in the force's major crime unit launched a fast-moving investigation into the offence in the hope that they would be able to catch the offender before he'd had the chance to commit another crime. We were looking for people that may have seen the offender within that locality. We were looking for those other lines of inquiry and making sure that we didn't lose any evidence. So there were things like a, uh, a can of monster drink that was recovered uh, extensive house-to-house, -house, extensive CCTV inquiries were, were undertaken. Local clubs and local businesses were visited uh, just in case the offender had come from that, that locality. And they were just some of the lines of inquiry that were pursued in those early days. So a volume of work over a very, very short period of time. The victim underwent medical examination. We got a full DNA profile back from the offender of that victim from where he'd ejaculated and we were able to send that away to the National DNA Database. Initially, we thought that uh, with rape being such an emotive offence, uh, we know that statistically um, either people know the person that's attacked them or the people are likely to be on the National DNA Database. But on this occasion, uh, both those circumstances turned out to be uh, working against us. Despite forensic experts recovering a full DNA profile from the scene of the Dali Abbey attack, there was no match to that sample on the National DNA database. The offender was still completely unknown. The, the DNA is obviously a critical line of inquiry for us, and it really is important for us to try and be able to find the person that's responsible as quickly as possible because of the impact that it has on that community confidence, it has the, the impact uh, on the victim and what we've got now is we've got somebody that has attacked a young lady in broad daylight within our community and we've no way of essentially finding them through their DNA at that stage. While that line of inquiry carried on, detectives launched a media appeal to try and find witnesses or anyone who might have recognised the offender from the description given by the victim. Whenever we do an appeal um, of a serious nature, a sexual offence, and, and we don't know who's responsible, um, it's a massive impact for the community. And I'm absolutely sure it, it frightens some members of the community. Um, I've got an 18-year-old daughter, I live in Derby, I've got friends in Derby, and it, it, it does, it does affect people. And you have to balance the, the fear of crime uh, against the, the safety element and the safety message that you give. And because most investigations we have about rape, you know, to be fair, we normally catch the offender fairly quickly. Um, so to have one where we haven't is a real rarity, it's a risk. Um, so yeah, the, the community would have been afraid by it, but we balance that, we try and balance that by telling them everything we're doing to catch the person. But despite weeks of appealing and dozens of names being given by the public, the Dali Abbey rapist was still on the loose. And in December 2015, in a remote nature reserve just a few miles away from the first attack, he struck again. What the victim told us was that um, she was using a, a cut through from Spondon to Chadderston, uh, which is a relatively remote path, but it's a well lit and well used path uh, that links those two villages. When the victim approaches that path, she sees somebody stood at what she describes as a kink in that path. So it's, you can see people in both directions, but you can quickly disappear into the bushes and, and not be seen. Because she's seeing this person, she actually said to a friend, hang on, there's somebody loitering 
within that, that footpath. I'm going to hold off a minute before I walk down. So she waited a short period of time until she was satisfied in herself that that person had probably gone. She's then walked that path and she's on the phone all the time to a friend and she's talking around the, the meeting that she's going to have. As the victim walks past, he's then grabbed that victim from behind, which is a similarity to the attack from, from Dolly Park. And then that attack takes place. Fortunately, the victim on the second occasion struggled, was screaming down the phone to a friend to call the police. And so unable to um, subdue his victim because the victim was struggling and fighting and screaming for a friend, uh, the offender essentially made off into the darkness from that location without actually completing a full attack. But it was still an horrific ordeal for that victim, something which has left her very, very uh, traumatised.